All right, so we're in Hebrews 5 today. We're making progress. We're getting almost halfway uh, through Hebrews, Hebrews 5. And uh, today's sermon deals with Jesus as our eternal high priest. So Hebrews 5 is where we are. Hebrews 5, 1 begins, For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself is also compassed with infirmity. And by reason hereof he ought, as for the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. So what we start out with here in Hebrews 5 is that we have a picture of the high priest of Israel, a human being who was selected among men from the Levitical priesthood, as the high priest, a human himself, who could empathize with our sinful condition. The high priest, every single year, would go into the temple, into the inner sanctuary, into the Holy of Holies, and once a year, he would offer a uh, sacrifice. It was the atoning sacrifice, what people call Yom Kippur today, and uh, it was basically the the one-time sacrifice offered for the whole nation of Israel. So this will be done on behalf of the uh, entire nation of Israel, including, it says here, himself. He not only offered sacrifice for all the people of Israel, but he himself, as a human being who's sinful, would also receive that same sacrifice. In Leviticus 16.24, it says that he would first make atonement for himself because he too was sinful unlike our high priest, Jesus Christ. So it says, Leviticus 16, 24, going back to the law, to the Levitical priesthood, which just references, and he shall wash his flesh with water in the holy place and put on his garments and come forth and offer his burnt offering and the burnt offering of the people and make an atonement for himself and for the people. Verse 30 says, For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you, that ye may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. So again, this was done not only for the nation of Israel, but the high priest of Israel, himself being human, also had sins. He wasn't perfect. He was just another man like anybody else who was appointed to that office. And so not only did he have to offer sacrifice for everybody, but First, he would offer sacrifice for himself, cleanse himself by the blood of the rams and goats that were foreshadows of Jesus Christ so that he could be clean first and then offer sacrifice for the rest of the nation. And it would be this elaborate cleansing ritual of sacrifice where all the priest's garments and all the holy vessels of the temple, even the mercy seat itself and all the vessels, the table of showbread and the candlestick and all the everything basically in the temple uh, would be cleansed by the blood. It was just this big bloody, you know, scene inside the temple uh, before the actual atonement because that blood had to cleanse. It was all, you know, symbolic of the blood of Jesus. And it wasn't, you know, it was sprinkling and then um, wasn't like, you know, blood gushing out, but, you know, it was just sprinkling the, uh, the vessels there. Leviticus 16, 16 through 17 says, and he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions and all their sins. And so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness. And there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goeth in to make an atonement in the holy place until he come out and have made an atonement for himself and for his household and for all the congregation of Israel. So the entire nation, including the high priest, would be cleansed, and this would all take place in the holy place. What is the holy place? Inside of the temple, you had two chambers. Well, first of all, you had the outer court of the temple where all the, the brass uh, brass uh, 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 utensils, not the utensils, like the bowls and the uh, all the, all the uh, uh, vessels of the temple were there where they would sacrifice and cleanse all, all the garments of the priests and then also sacrifice the, uh, the animals outside in the outer court. Uh, and they would bring that in into the temple. And then inside the temple, you had two different chambers. You had the outer court, uh, 
of the temple or the, the first part of the temple where the table of showbread was and the golden candlestick and all of the vessels inside the temple. And then you had the inner sanctuary. It was like another chamber inside of the temple where the mercy seat was and the, uh, the Ten Commandments were and, and the Ark of the Covenant and all the vessels that were inside. And so he would enter into the holy place and perform this atonement. And so this would be done once a year, every year, as a symbol of Jesus's eternal sacrifice. And we'll actually study this more in depth as we get into Hebrews 9 and 10, which gets a little bit more in depth into this. We'll look at all of those rituals in the temple and, you know, what exactly would occur in the Old Testament through all these ritual uh, sacrifices. But in Hebrews 9, 7, just jumping ahead a little bit, it says, but into the second went the high priest alone once every year. That second, that's the inner temple. That's the Holy of Holies, that second chamber inside of the temple. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. So the high priest was the only one allowed inside of the Holy of Holies. Question, Megan. Didn't they also like have to tie a rope to him? Yeah. Just in case like he was struck dead or something? Right. They couldn't go in there and then they could out. That's that's true. Yeah. And those are some of the really neat details. You know, people think Leviticus is this boring book. There's actually some really interesting details. They would have to tie a rope to, to the priests when they would go in, into the Holy of Holies, uh, because if they messed up and they didn't follow the ordinances of, of the law and of the, the, the proper way to, to offer that sacrifice, they could be struck down dead and they would Pull them out. So yeah, that's one of the uh, the details that are that are pretty interesting in, in Leviticus. Uh, but we see here that it says that again he was you know he had to be cleansed himself because he was human and also plagued by sin, and the atoning sacrifice had to be done every single year because it was a temporary provision until Christ would become our final and ultimate high priest. So this was done year after year as a symbol, as a foreshadowing of that eternal sacrifice that Christ himself would perform. That's why once Christ did that, now we don't need that you know, yearly sacrifice. It was a one-time sacrifice that Christ did, replacing the old Levitical ordinances of the law. That's why we're no longer under the law. We're not Hebrew roots. We're not you know, going to go back and follow those kind of things because their whole purpose was simply to point us to Christ. Now Christ is here. So we have, we have Christ himself. We don't need that uh, to go back to those sacrifices anymore. But Hebrews 10.3 says, but in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. So again, Hebrews is emphasizing that those provisions were temporary. They were merely placeholders until Jesus Christ himself could come and make that sacrifice and then ultimately become our high priest. And so the writer of Hebrews makes this connection between the provisional high priest of Israel and Jesus Christ, who is now our new permanent high priest, who only had to suffer once for our sins, this one-time sacrifice. He doesn't keep going back and, and sacrificing himself. He only had to suffer once as the eternal high priest. We see in, in Hebrews 9, again, jumping around a little bit because these are all connected thoughts as we move forward in Hebrews. Hebrews 9.25 says, nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Find that interesting also that they mention way back in Hebrews that this is now the end of the world, even back then 2,000 years ago. You know, so we're still waiting that time. That's not to say that Christ is delayed or hasn't come. It's just that we are in that period of history where we are in the end times. We're already there. We're just not in the latter half, in those latter seven years that we traditionally think of as the last days, as the end times, uh, you know, which is the tribulation and, and the rapture and then the wrath of God and all, all those things that, that we've talked about. So there's the end times, which was really initiated by the first coming of Christ. 
uh, as we see here, and that gets mentioned, you know, throughout, even in the book of Acts, but the last days, the, the final, you know, the latter days of the end times is what we normally, you know, classically think of when we think of the end times. Those are the last seven years, which are, you know, markedly different than what we're experiencing today. Uh, so it says, you know, he, he only had to suffer once. And again, we'll delve deeper into this. Uh, into this, you know, as far as the high priest and the connection between Jesus Christ and all of those ritual sacrifices in Hebrews 9, 10 and beyond, because the second half of the book of Hebrews, once we get past chapter 6, uh, which really deals with Christian apostasy and uh, falling away, and it's a very difficult chapter, the next chapter that we'll get into, but once we get past chapter 6, it's almost like Hebrews really just goes into the whole Levitical priesthood and, and Melchizedek and, and how that, that pertains to us. And so we'll cover those things uh, in greater detail. But the high priest of Israel, as we see here, was merely a placeholder for Jesus Christ and a foreshadow of the real sacrifice. Hebrews 5 uh, verse 4 says, And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. So what this is saying is that Jesus didn't make himself our high priest of his own volition. This was something that he was called to by God the Father. This authority was given to Jesus to become our high priest by God the Father himself. Now, this is something that, that God said to him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. That was at the, at the baptism of Jesus. And he's referring back to that, saying it's that same God who said, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee, that has the authority as God the Father, as, as, the, as, you know, the, high, as the uh, most high God, to anoint Jesus and to separate him unto the task of becoming our high priest. Now, Jesus is the only begotten Son of God from all time, from all eternity as the eternal Son of God, but he was called into this position as high priest and anointed as the high priest by God the Father. So again, this task was given to Jesus Christ alone to be the high priest, to be the mediator between himself and sinful man, and he opened up a way for sinful man to approach God. We see an interesting passage back in Ezekiel. Ezekiel 22.3, God says this through Ezekiel. He says, And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. So no man was able and worthy enough to stand in the gap for the children of Israel, for God's people. God found no man because all men are sinful. And so this was what Jesus Christ became for us, a high priest. As our high priest, he stands in the gap and he intercedes on our behalf. Jumping a little bit ahead again to Hebrews 7, <clears throat> verse 24, it says, But this man, because he continueth forever hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. So this is picturing Jesus perpetually there before God the Father as our eternal high priest, constantly making intercession for us on our behalf, right? So we're sinning. We're sinning almost constantly in the flesh. I mean, our bad thoughts are sin. When we're impatient, it's sin. When we have pride, it's sin. It's very easy to let pride uh, seep in. It's, you know, that, that's something that gets Christians quite a bit. Um, the Bible says that the thought of foolishness is sin. So even our foolish thoughts, you know, we're in this constant state of sin in the flesh, right? But in the spirit, we're, we're not. Um, and so as we're in this, in this state of sin in the flesh, Jesus is there constantly, perpetually making intercession on our behalf. Now, when I say we're constantly in sin in, in the flesh, I don't mean like every second you're literally doing something wrong and sinning. You know, 
But just generally speaking, you know, our flesh can do no good thing. Our flesh is that old man. It's corrupt. It's, it is sin. You know, we've been inhabited by sin with the sin nature in the flesh. And so that's why we need a perpetual high priest interceding and mediating on our behalf, which we see the Bible says that he's doing. And so without that high priest or intercessor, you would be approaching God in all of your sins. You couldn't just approach God the Father without a high priest, without someone who's making intercession for you and, and someone who's you know taking all of your sins and, and cleansing you. Uh, you would just be showing up in front of God with all your flesh, all your sins, all the bad stuff you've ever done from the moment you were born till the moment you die. And that's why we cannot approach God without a savior. We cannot approach God the Father without the one that he's anointed and called to be the high priest. It says that it was God the Father who appointed Jesus to this to this role. And so that's why no other religion can offer salvation. They can offer, uh, you know, a, a veneer of, of doing good works and a veneer of morality, but it's only a veneer. It's not real. It's just the outside. And so we need Jesus Christ as our high priest in order to be saved. And God, because he's just, would be forced to reject you in order to remain holy and impartial and good if you didn't have that high priest. So that's why you can't come to God without Jesus. No other religion, no other faith has a worthy or adequate intercessor or high priest who will stand in the gap for you the way that God called Ezekiel to proclaim. It was Jesus Christ who died for you and earned this right as the Son of God who alone is worthy. And that's why Again, no other religion is consistent in their theology. They really offer no solution to salvation. They really leave it up to either your own uh, works. And they say, well, you know, God's going to you know, weigh the balances and, and see if he did more good than bad. Uh, but, you know, that's just kind of iffy. You know, how does, how does that work? Um, is, is God going to let imperfect people into heaven? You're this horrible sinner. You did these terrible things, but you did some other good things. So it kind of balances out. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. You know, so we need a savior. We need an intercessor. We need a high priest who can offer that cleansing and that blood sacrifice as a perfect high priest. And that's what really Hebrews 5 is about today. It's about having Jesus as our priest forever. And so... Uh, Hebrews 7 also says in verse 26, for such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. That's really important. He's separate from sinners and made higher than the heavens. If he wasn't separate from sinners, he wouldn't be qualified to offer sacrifice on our sins. That's why Muhammad doesn't save. That's why Buddha doesn't save. They were ultimately men. And they, they weren't the son of God. They didn't have any, any particular holiness about them that made them, you know, to be qualified to be our high priest. Only Christ was. Verse 27, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. So notice how many times it mentions that, that even that high priest of Israel had to offer sacrifice first for himself before he could offer for others, because it's pointing out the fact that he's human and ultimately sinful, and only Jesus Christ is, is perfect and without sin. Now, the high priest of Israel in, in ancient times and biblical times was also called the anointed priest. That was another name. He was the anointed. He was the, the anointed priest, the high priest, or the priest who was anointed. That's how the Bible would refer to him in certain passages, how the people referred to the high priest as the anointed. For example, Leviticus 4.16 says, And the priest that is anointed shall bring of the bullock's blood to the tabernacle of the congregation. So it's the priest that is anointed. And what's cool, really cool about that is that Christ the word Christ means anointed in the Greek. So Christ is the Greek word for anointed one. So in essence, Jesus, what it's saying is that Jesus is our high priest. Jesus, when you say Jesus is Christ, you're saying that Jesus is the anointed or the anointed priest forever. 
And so Hebrews 5, 6 says, And he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So everywhere that we see, Jesus is an eternal priest. He does the sacrifice one time. He's the eternal son of God. And this ties Jesus, our high priest, or our Christ priest, to the eternal priesthood of Melchizedek. So Hebrews 5 is really propping up Jesus as the high priest of Israel. He replaces the high priest of Israel as our Christ priest. That's ultimately what that, that word means. He's our savior. He's our priest after the order of Melchizedek. And Melchizedek, um, we're going to get more into Melchizedek as we get uh, past Hebrews, you know, like Hebrews 6, 7, uh, Hebrews 7 talks more about Melchizedek. And so we'll get into greater detail about who is Melchizedek and, you know, why is that relevant and pertinent. But Genesis fourteen eighteen is where we first see Melchizedek. And it says Melchizedek, Melchizedek king of Salem. And if you think about Salem is Jerusalem, right? So king of Jerusalem. So Melchizedek was the king of Jerusalem, which is the king of kings, the Lord Jesus, right? And so Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. There we see the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. And he was the priest of the most high God. And so, you know, it's important to understand Jesus as our high priest. We think of him as our savior, as the son of God, as the one who died. But how often do we really think of him as he is our high priest? You know, that's, he's the one that gives us access to God because, uh, you know, God, you have to go through a priest to get through, like Catholics teach. They teach that you have to go through a priest to get to God. But where they fail, is that Jesus is that priest. And now we have a high priest that we go to directly. We don't need a human high, uh, high priest or a human priest anymore. We can go directly to God the Father through our one and only high priest, Jesus Christ. So we do need a high priest. You do need a priest to approach God because God is holy, perfect, separate. You know, he's completely other than human, you know. Um, so we need a human high priest, which is where the incarnation ties in. And you get a human high priest that was that worthy and, and able to die for us. So I believe uh, that Jesus was there from the beginning as our high priest in the person of Melchizedek as a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. That that was Jesus Christ himself there meeting with Abraham. And again, we'll get back to Melchizedek in Hebrews 6 and 7. But Melchizedek first met with Abraham in Genesis and he brought forth bread and wine. And this was before there was a Levitical priesthood. So the Melchizedek priesthood predates the Levitical priesthood, the law of Moses. Before the law was given, Jesus himself was there as the eternal high priest. The Melchizedek priesthood, therefore, is superior to the Levitical priesthood. And it came before, during, and after the giving of the law. Christ was there throughout that whole whole process. And Hebrews 7, 3 says that he is without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. So how can a human priest abide a priest continually? Because it wasn't just a mere human high priest, it was Jesus himself pre-incarnate. And so, you know, Jesus is our perpetual high priest, ever ready to make intercession for the saints. And Hebrews 5, specifically verse 2, even began the chapter describing our high priest, saying that he is one who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. So this is a declaration. First, it's talking about the high priest, but Jesus, we know, was, was human and became flesh, right? So this is a declaration of Christ's humanity, meaning that Jesus, as our high priest, became a man and suffered the temptation of every sin so that he himself could empathize with our predicament of sin. 
Hebrews 4.15 that we just read, you know, the previous time in Hebrews was setting this up for us. It said, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. So in this way, there's a human connection to the high priest. That's why you had a human high priest uh, who could understand our infirmities, who could relate to us and understand that it's difficult to be tempted and to, and to you know, rebuke sin and to withstand sin. Uh, Jesus himself as that God man, as that God who became man, was taken up by the devil into the wilderness and tempted with every sin known to man. And having overcome them, he is now able to save us and intermediate on our behalf as our high priest, offering his own blood for our sins. So just like the high priest of Israel, you know, he was a man, except he only had to offer that sacrifice one time and not with the blood of rams and goats, but by his own blood. Hebrews 5, 7 through 9 says, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, yet he learned, uh, yet learned he obedience <clears throat> by the things which he suffered. So this, is a, this gives us a lot of insight into what Jesus was going through at the time. This is a reference to the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus pleaded with God for the cup to pass from him. It says that he pleaded with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death. He knew that God the Father could say the word and he wouldn't have to go through that immense suffering and pain on the cross on our behalf. He cried, he, he pleaded with God and cried with his own tears and sweat uh, dripping with blood to spare him if it were possible with strong crying and tears. Yet being perfect, Jesus was obedient to the point of death, knowing exactly what was in store for him because it was God's will that he suffer to save us. And so Philippians 2.8 says, in being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And so it's kind of strange for us to picture Jesus crying hard like that and pleading with God, you know, to, to spare him because we think of him as the son of God and, you know, perfect and impenetrable. But it really shows that he was fully human and fully capable of feeling all of the pain and all of the suffering and also all of the, the difficulty of temptation. Yet he overcame that temptation and, and was perfect and he humbled himself and was obedient unto God, even to the point of death. And therein lies our salvation. That's how we get saved. It's much deeper than simply having to become a so-called good person and being obedient and doing good works to be saved. First of all, that's impossible. But it was Christ himself enduring the shame and suffering of the cross so that he could become our high priest and offer himself for our sins. There's nothing greater than that. So when we add to that and we, and we try to bring in our own ego and our own pride and our own selves and say, we're going to help you out, Christ. We're going to help you save us with our works. You know, it's pretty insulting to God the Father, right? So, you know, it, it, when we understand the atoning sacrifice and the work and the suffering that Jesus himself endured, it really should leave no room for works in your theology in any way, not even a, a shred of it, not even a little speck or a little dot. You know, it comes down to it's his blood, his atoning sacrifice, which was just horrific and great and horrendous, Versus, you know, us trying to like help the old lady across the street and be a good person, you know, that can't save you, even though those are things that we should all strive to be like Christ and to do, to be conformed to his image so that he can be pleased with us, so that his sacrifice won't be in vain, so that we won't trample underfoot the son of God. We should do those good works, but we have to understand the foundational teaching of salvation is, is through the high priest. If we don't have a high priest, we cannot approach God the Father. There's simply no other way. So Hebrews 5, 9 says, in being made perfect, being made perfect, that's the standard. He became the author of eternal salvation unto all them 
that obey him. So Jesus became our savior through perfect obedience to God the Father in the law. Through death and obedience, he became the author of eternal salvation. It's eternal. Once you have it, it's eternal, just by definition. And the Bible says that Jesus being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Now, does that mean that you have to be uh, perfect and obey Jesus through good works in order to be saved. These are the kind of verses that read by itself, you could start making a case for works that, well, you have to obey Jesus in the word in order to be saved. But what exactly are we obeying when it comes to salvation? What, are, what, are we, what do we have to obey? <clears throat> well, John 640 says, and this is the will of him that sent me. This is Jesus speaking. <clears throat> and this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So the will of the Father to be obedient to God the Father is to believe the Son. It says, you know, everyone, it's his will, and this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. So it's about obeying the gospel. It's about obeying the tenets and the principles of the gospel. It's about obeying and believing in Christ as the atonement for our sins and subjecting ourselves to him as our savior. It's about obeying the gospel, not the works of the law, which Paul expounds on constantly in every epistle. You see it, it's not about following the works of the law. Christ is, is the end of righteousness you know, to, uh, to pertaining to the law. So Paul says in Romans 10, one through four, he says, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, not their righteousness, but God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. So it answers it there. That's a pretty important passage because it says they're going around trying to establish their own righteousness instead of uh, submitting themselves unto the righteousness of God. So what are we submitting to? What are we obeying? We're obeying the fact that Jesus Christ is our high priest and, is, and he's the one that makes atonement for our sins. We're obeying the gospel. What are we submitting ourselves to? It says it right there, the righteousness of God. And then verse four, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. So it comes out right there. It's the end of the law. You don't, you know, you don't follow the law to be saved. He's the end of the law to everyone that believeth. So obeying uh, the gospel is simply believing the gospel. And uh, it's understanding that Jesus took your sins and died instead of you and made intercession as your high priest. Romans 3.22, even the righteousness of God, okay, it's not your righteousness again, but God's. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe for there is no difference. So it gets clarified what, you know, we can't hang our doctrine on, on one verse that on the surface could be read a certain way. We have to look at the whole Bible. Philippians 3, 9, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness, which is of God by faith. So I can't emphasize enough that salvation is by grace through faith. Otherwise, it would negate the entire purpose of having a high priest who offers sacrifices for your sins. Hebrews 5, 10 through 12 says, called of God in high priest after the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. And so every time I read that, I'm like, oh man, I want to know what else he had to say about Melchizedek. Like he was the writer of Hebrews was like, I want to teach you more about Melchizedek, but I can't because you're dull of hearing. 
You know, so we could have had so much more in the word about it in the book of Hebrews if, if the Hebrews weren't dull of hearing. But it required, what it required for them to go on into these deeper doctrines was having a rock solid foundational understanding of the faith, which apparently the Hebrews lacked. This is, most of these epistles are corrections to the church and teaching the church about the difference between grace and the law. And so verse 12 in Hebrews 5, he says, for, for when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Now, this is interesting. It's a, it's a very famous passage about the milk and the meat of the word. But it's interesting because it says that they have need that one teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. So this means that this shows that at one point, the Hebrews knew the first principles at one point. They, they knew and they understood the first principles of the oracles of God, but then they had slipped into error. You know, so we see that it's possible for Christians to slip into error when it comes to foundational teaching. He says that you have need that one teach you again. It was those first principles that saved them to begin with, and then they got into deeper, you know, error and teaching by trying to be deep in the word and, and reading, misreading the word, or maybe they get false teachers and, and fake epistles that were being written, and you had Judaizers who were teaching them to go back and follow the law. And so they had, they've kind of been confused by, by false teaching. And so at one point they knew, but they slipped into error concerning the fundamentals of the faith the basic principles. And this becomes very important as we approach Hebrews 6. Hebrews 6, which we're going to get to next time, is one of the most difficult chapters in the Bible because it deals with Christian apostasy and Christians falling away from the faith and serious questions of eternal security. So that's a, it's a particularly difficult chapter to understand. We're going to work together through that when we get there. And so the ending of Hebrews chapter 5 is really setting us up for Hebrews chapter 6, where Hebrews chapter 6, it begins with listing some of the basic principles of the word of God, as we'll see in the next chapter. He begins to list what those first principles are that they've kind of erred from and, and fallen away from and been confused on, as we'll see next time. But this is a bit of a rebuke. He's like, you guys are babes in Christ when it comes to the word of God. He's saying to them, you know, you need to be given milk like a little baby. You know, it's like, it's kind of an insult when you think about it. You know, we read these passages, it's such a deep part of, of scripture, you know, uh, babes in Christ need the milk of the word and more mature saints and Christians can understand the deeper things of the word of God. But it's kind of really, if you think about it, it's an insult. He's saying, you guys, you need the milk of the word right now. Um, he's like, you're unskilled with the word of God, and I can't even begin to teach on the deep doctrines like Melchizedek because you're dull of hearing. So uh, the author of Hebrews, which I do believe was Paul, had this way of sometimes he, he extreme, he'd be extremely gentle. He says, be gentle unto all men. But when it came to scripture and doctrine and teaching, he could be pretty, um, you know, he could have a sharp, a razor sharp tongue there, you know. So he says, you're dull of hearing. You're still trying to work out the basics of the gospel, like grace through faith and the pillars of the faith and the place of the law uh, in Christ under the new covenant, and whether you have to be water baptized, and all of these basic principles. And so I'm still having to correct you and teach you on the basic principles of the oracles of God. That's how he begins to wind down uh, Hebrews chapter 5. Now, what are the oracles of God? What, is that, what does that phrase mean? Well, a primary definition of, of oracles means spoken. It's a, it's a spoken word. So oracles of God is the, literally would mean the spoken word of God. That's an oracle that's given verbally. Um, in other words, the oracles of God, it's a spoken word, the word of God, or the word. It's literally the word. An oracle is the word of God. So an oracle is a divine spoken word of God delivered to the prophets 
and wise men who as priests of God transmitted that word or oracle to God's people. So the way that we had the Bible uh, penned and, and written and established was that as God gave his holy messengers, his divine message, they would hear the word. They would audibly hear his word and they would write it down, often through scribes and assistants that they had. So often you had Paul had Timothy writing for him or other people that were there traveling with him who would write the word for him as the prophets and apostles were given uh, divine utterances. You know, they would hear God's word and they would, they would speak it and then the scribe would write it down. And so that's how you had the, uh, the scripture and, and the Bible was written. And so this was how the Bible was written. It was audibly given through the oracles of God. And so that's what that reference is. It's the oracles because it's a verbal, out loud, you know, it's something that the prophets and the apostles literally heard. And so he's rebuking the, the Hebrews and he's saying, all you're suitable for is the milk of the word. And until you get more spiritually mature, mature and increase in godly wisdom and learning, you're not going to be able to digest the meat of the word because you're not ready for it. How are you going to understand the difficult things in the word of God if you don't yet even understand the basic principles of the word of God? So it's really vital that we study God's word and we study God's word on a daily basis, morning, afternoon, and night. We need to be immersed in God's word in order to understand the basic principles of the word of God and the oracles of God so that we can then go on to deeper teaching. We need to have a firm grasp on the foundations and the basics of the gospel so there's no question and no doubt in order to go on to deeper things. And this is what Paul really leads up to, or the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 6. Um, you know, we can't be arguing about eternal security and grace through faith and whether God sends people to heaven or to hell, whether hell is real. You know, these are the basic elementary principles of the word of God and that every Christian should know and adhere to pretty much from day one as a, as a babe in Christ, you know? So he ends Hebrews five thirteen through 14. He says, for everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are full of age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So I really love that. It says by reason of use, you have to use the word of God. You have to study the word of God. You have to be immersed in the word of God in order to understand the word of God and the basic principles of the, of the oracles of God. You have to spend time studying the Bible daily, regularly, in season, out of season. You have to be versed in it like it's second nature. Because, you know, you got to be one of those guys who, you know, I remember my old friend Marshall, he always had a little Bible in his pocket, you know, uh, wherever he went, he had his Bible with him. And at moment's notice, he would pull it out, you know, so we got it. We should carry the word of God with us. We need to have, you know, we need to be just constantly like it's second nature uh, as though you're always reading it. So even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So how do we exercise? How do we know what's good and evil by studying God's word? How are you going to know what's good and what's evil, what's right and wrong, if you're not studying God's word? It says your senses will be exercised and you'll develop the spiritual muscles that are needed to discern both good and evil. You know, we don't, we don't understand morality through external sources. It's not our, our opinions and our feelings or the culture or your friends or your, your peers or your employee, your employer or anything else. We get morality and understanding of right and wrong, good and evil from studying God's word. Kind of like how you see today with these liberal churches where there's not, they're not really, there's never any word of God going on in there. And they don't know, and then they're like, you know, homosexual is fine, and all this stuff is fine. Absolutely. Discern between good and evil.
Absolutely. If it's, I mean, it's just plain and simple, right? It's by reason of use of, if you're not immersed in the word of God, you're going to drift into the world's ideas about what's good and evil instead of standing firm on the word of God, who's, you know, who's wiser and he knows more than us. So um, it's so important to be just constantly in the word. Second Timothy three sixteen says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And I love how it says all scripture. You know, you can't cherry pick the Bible. The Old Testament is God's word. The New Testament is God's word. It's all inspired by God from Genesis to Revelation, whether you're in Leviticus or Deuteronomy or one of the epistles of Paul or the words of Jesus himself. It's all inspired by God and it's all relevant still for today. So don't let those freaky hyper dispensationalists tell you that the Old Testament is no longer relevant or that Jesus' his words are not relevant and now it's only Paul's epistles and the Pauline letters. You know, there's a lot of different religions, pseudo Christian religions, that will teach you to, to forget parts of the Word of God. You know, we, from all of it, from Genesis to Revelation, it's relevant and it's the Word of God. So we may be under a new covenant, but every word of God is still true and able to instruct us. So I want to kind of wind down today's sermon with an admonition to study the word of God, to study the Bible. Matthew 25, 35 says, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. So God's word is eternal. It doesn't change. It's immutable. It's more enduring, in fact, it says, than the physical creation. It endures beyond the grass and, you know, heaven and earth and all these physical materials because the physical world itself was created by the word of God. So even when this earth passes away and the universe melts and, and is gone, God's word will still remain. It's the one thing that's going to remain eternal along with those who put their faith in him and trust in him. Psalm 119, 105 says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So God's word gives us instruction on where to go in life. It, it shows us the way. It's our guide. It teaches us what to believe and what to think and how to discern between good and evil. It lights up our path in our way so that we know which direction to go in in life. If you don't have the word of God, you're going to drift you're inevitably going to drift into the uh, world and the way that the world thinks. We have to stand firm on the word of God. How will you know what's right and wrong if you don't know the Bible? The Bible tells us what's right and wrong, not the world or the devil. John 12, 48 says, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. So it's the word of God or the oracles of God that will judge us in the end. Our salvation will stand on the basis of the word of God. It's the word of God that determines truth. It doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what you think. It matters what God thinks. I don't need to know why God's word says something. I just obey because it's God's word. And a good disciple obeys God's word. Finally, Proverbs 30, verse 5 says, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. So it all just comes back to the word of God. And that's why Paul goes into chapter 6. We'll just read a little bit of chapter 6, uh, saying in Hebrews 6, 1 through 3, Therefore, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permit. Next time in Hebrews, we'll get more into what Hebrews 6 talks about and what these principles are, these first principles, uh, what it means to, to repent from dead works and of, of faith toward God, to go towards faith towards God. So we'll get into all of that. Um, but he, he lists some of those basic foundational teachings of the gospel, and he calls them 
the principle the principles of the doctrine of Christ. So we'll start with that next time in Hebrews 6, covering some of those foundational teachings of the doctrine of Christ before we get into, right after that, he gets into the very difficult portion of Christians falling away. And so we'll, we'll get a little bit more into that. Pray for wisdom as I, as I teach from that and understanding. We really want to nail that down and just understand Hebrews 6 once and for all. And, you know, I mean, we won't understand its fullness um, you know, ever, because God's word is eternal and, and is full of depth, but we can begin to, to breach it. So I'd like to end today's sermon uh, with a quote from Matthew Henry in 1708, because it, it really pertains to Jesus as our high priest. I invite anyone who doesn't have Jesus as their high priest to, to make him your high priest, because you can't get to God the Father any other way there's literally no other way. And Matthew Henry says in 1708, he says, The high priest must be a man, a partaker of our nature. This shows that man had sinned, for God would not suffer sinful man to come to him alone. But everyone is welcome to God that comes to him by this high priest. And as we value acceptance with God and pardon, we must apply by faith to this, our great high priest, Christ Jesus, who can intercede for those that are out of the way of truth, duty, and happiness. One who has tenderness to lead them back from the bypaths of error, sin, and misery. Those only can expect assistance from God and acceptance with him. So I thought it was very pertinent. You know, God is a compassionate God. His, his son, Jesus Christ, understands our infirmities. He understands how difficult it is to, to stand in the world, to, to flee from sin, and to cling to biblical principle and doctrine our entire lives. So I just invite you to, to if you're saved, uh, if you're not saved, to come to the high priest. And if you are saved, to go through the high priest to God the Father and just... Um, just, you know, stand, stand on his word. More than anything right now, we need to stand on the word of God. And he understands the difficulty of that in this world that wants to lead us astray at every turn. So with that, I'll end. And uh, next week, as I mentioned, we'll do our, our sit-down Bible study with the larger group next week that's coming. And we'll be in uh, 1 Corinthians. We're going to start a new book. We'll have that in-person, old-fashioned uh, Bible study. So looking forward to that next week. Uh, Father God, we, we thank you, Father, for providing us with such a great high priest, God. And it just makes it so clear, God, what the place of works are in our salvation. And it's basically nothing, literally nothing, when it comes to our works. It's only the obedience that, that Jesus had, uh, even to the point of death, offering himself for, for our sins, and then as our high priest, offering his own blood, God, um, as an intermediary and as an intercession on our behalf. Help us to fully and firmly understand that as we go into the more uh, difficult portions, the meat of the word uh, that the writer of Hebrews was talking about here. I think more than anything, this section of Hebrews just kind of reaffirms to me that Paul is likely the author of, of, this, of this epistle. And just thank you for, for wisdom from your word. And I pray a special blessing, God, upon the children of God who have Jesus as their high priest. And those who don't, God, may they find you as quickly as possible. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.